Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah Allahumma salli wa sallim wa an'im wa akrim wa barik ala sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fil awalin wa fil akhirin wa fil mala'i al-a'la ila yawm al-dini thumma amma ba'd um, as always, it is a blessing and an honor to be with the uh, Wailing community. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase you always and grant you uh, all and all of us and our loved ones and our families the best of this life and the next. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, bring healing to those who are ill and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on those who have passed and may this Ramadan, this sacred and blessed month that we are all now witnessing by the grace of Allah and His permission and His generosity that He has opened up for us another door of Ramadan, a door where we can attain spiritual heights that are unparalleled in, in the span of the year. And, and Alhamdulillah, Allah is so generous that He gives us another Ramadan. And so I ask Allah that He allows us to have a very special Ramadan, a Ramadan that is replete with um, guidance and increase and forgiveness and healing and enlightenment. You know, um, I was sharing a few moments ago with another group that you know, one of the beauties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows upon us um, in this month uh, is that is the, is the nature of our relationship with the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, the fact that we're able to go and we pray tarawih or, you know, we, we have an iftar and so we're praying maghrib and isha. And um, especially in the last 10 nights, we go to the masjid and we pray a lot more. And, you know, and that's one of the great blessings that we, we really, you know, want to have in our lives. Um, and there's no doubt, uh, however, that uh, having to make it to the masjids can sometimes, you know, objectively be um, uh, tiring or a burden or a challenge. And, um, but one of the big gifts that we have this year um, with our COVID Ramadan is that the masjid, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has been brought to our homes. You know, and, you know, we've been talking about the need and the importance of establishing a masjid in your home. And, and whether it's just a small prayer mat or a section of, of a room or an entire room for that matter. But the fact is that, you know, uh, Allah has been so generous with us in that rather than us having to get up and go to the masjid, the masjid was brought all the way to us. And because I know that inshallah, all of us in our intentions are that we would go to the masjid. You know, and we would go more and more in the for Fajr prayer or for Maghrib prayer or for Isha prayer, for Taraweeh prayers, right? So, you know, with the right intention and the right spirit, that inshallah, the prayers that we're praying in our home um, are as if we're praying them in the masjid. That requires what? The right intention, um, the right, you know, spiritual disposition. And, and you know, Prophet Sallallahu says that from the seven who will be shaded on the day of judgment is a person whose heart is uh his heart is attached to the house of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right and so you know we should all have a yearning to be in the house of allah to be in mecca to be in medina to be in al-aqsa to be you know in in our masajid in wayland and to be in these spaces but the fact that we can't be physically there then we thank allah for bringing those spaces to our homes and we ask allah that every prayer we walk to in our homes, from our bedroom to our prayer mat, wherever it is in our home. Ya Allah, we ask you to make that a walk towards the house of Allah, you know, a walk towards the musalla uh, in our home. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all and increase you all. And, and I hope and pray that all of you are in the best of health and the best of spirits and that, you know, that this Ramadan uh, brings uh, into your lives and to all of our lives tremendous goodness for our children. May Allah protect our children and bless them and increase them and, and purify them and beautify them with the beauty of this religion. May, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of our loved ones from, from all difficulties and hardships. Those of us who are dealing with worry or anxiety or depression or fear, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us through this month of Ramadan to be liberated from, from, those, um, from those difficulties that I know can be so heavy on our hearts and so difficult to, to, to carry. And, and I shared on my prophetic living page, um, on the prophetic living page uh, two days ago, the dua, the dua, the supplication that is to be made to lift worry and to lift harm 
you know, uh, that, that is usually internal in nature, whether it's hem or gham, right? Whether it's worry or concern. And, and this dua is, Allahumma inni as'aluka bi kulli ismin huwa lak. O Allah, I ask you by every name that is yours. Anta sammayta bihi nafsak, that you named yourself. Aw anzaltahu fi kitabik, or that you sent down or you revealed in your book. Aw allamtahu ahadam min khalqik, or that you taught to one of your creation. Aw istathartah bihi fi ilmi al-ghaybi indak, or that a name of yours that you've kept for yourself in the, in the realm of the unseen, right? In the, in the, in the unseen realm of, of God's knowledge. And that is the Prophet ﷺ expressing clearly, oh Allah, I call upon you by all of your names, the ones that we know and the ones that we do not. And that's the humility of the Prophet uh, ﷺ. Ya Allah, I ask you that you make the, 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 the Qur'an your sacred and divine revelation. I ask you to make it the light of my heart. And I ask you to make it the spring of my chest, you know, the, the spring, the, 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 the light of my chest and the spring of my heart. And that's really what we hope with the book of Allah, the whole book of Allah, which is a book of healing and a book of nourishment and a book of increase and a book of, of, of beautification. Uh, and it's a book of clarity. The realities and the keys of the Quran are unlocked when we turn to it and we read the book of Allah. And we spend time in reflection. And the result is that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lifts the worries and the concerns, right? And that's really uh, from, the, from, from, from one of the many bounties of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this vein, I really wanted to talk about the idea of pain. And the idea of pain as at times almost synonymous um, with, 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 with growth and with benefit. To, to mean that when we think of accomplishing meaningful goals in life, whether it's to become, you know, to, to get a particular a credential, to, to become a, a doctor, to, uh, to build a muscle on your body, to, uh, to build a structure, uh, any virtuous accomplishment, to build a good habit like reading, all good habits require a certain level of pain that we're going to experience in life. Right? And I think this is experientially known to all of us. But perhaps the one place where it's not so obvious that pain and growth are synonymous is in the space of, of religious practice and spiritual growth. And that's a place where I think very often our assumptions are that we should be spiritually nourished and be given spiritual increase because we, we desire it or because we just kind of will it. But the fact of the matter is, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sunan, from, from the, the way in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, kind of uh, does things in this world and does things in this space of ours, is that he follows a basic logic. And the basic logic that is also prevalent in the space of spiritual growth and spiritual nourishment is that, is, is that it, it is very often synonymous with pain. And, when, when, when I say pain, I don't mean like, you know, masochistic pain in that kind of like, you know, negative sense. No, I mean what they consider to, what they consider to be a good burn. You know, when you, when you have to kind of like sit a few extra hours to get a chapter done, or you have to, you know, work out another extra half an hour to build out your muscle, or that you're going to really push yourself to wake up uh, early in the morning. And so you're going to sacrifice sleep all of that is some semblance of pain. It's an experience that, is, that, that can be considered painful. When you have to get up out of bed, it's physically a very painful thing to have to do. And when the Prophet Sallallahu first received revelation, when the, 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 when the Quran was first revealed, this sacred text that is full of all of these nourishing qualities that we, we spoke about and that you know, that we supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask you to make the Qur'an the light of my, my heart and the spring of my chest, that, you know, that, that worry is removed and concern is removed and anxiety is lifted. The first time the Prophet ﷺ experienced revelation, it was a painful experience. You know, it was physically painful. Jibreel grasped him very tightly. It was emotionally painful. 
because he didn't really quite understand what was happening to him. So he rushed to his wife Khadija and she is the one who gave him comfort and solace, right? So even at the first moment of revelation, there was a painful reality that played out, right? Meaning that it, it, it agitated the sensibilities. It agitated the senses and at times it agitates the sensibilities. And, and I think that this point is so significant because when we're talking about being servants who are in loving surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have to realize that it's going to take work and work that we would at times define as being painful, meaning that it's objectively hard and it's going to rub up against my sensibilities. You know, whether it's my pre preconceived notions about myself or about, you know, what is or what is not, or that physically I'm going to experience some agitation because I'm going to sacrifice certain types of comforts and pleasures, right? Uh, because it is objectively uh, meaningful for me to sacrifice some sleep to get up and pray Fajr on time, you know, and that's uh, the, 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 what the Prophet Sallallahu is indicating, you know, those who, who, who leave their beds yearning to go back to their beds, but they stand up, you know, to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, they, they leave their madja, they get up and they, 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 they almost run away from their bed, you know, يَهْجُرُونَ الْمَضَاجَى they, they migrate away from their beds. Why? For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My body wants it. I just, I love the comfort. I love the warmth. But I'm going to get up out of bed. I'm going to force my body out. You know, I'm, I love my food and I love my, my, my kunafa and I love my samosas and I love my gulab jamans and I love my, love my food and I love my drink, but I'm going to give it up. Why? For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I'm going to experience some pain in my stomach. I'm going to experience some pain of exhaustion or tire, why for Allah? Painful, you know? And, and when, I, when I, 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 no one should misconstrue what I'm saying is this, there's an, that pain is an objective. No, pain is an experience that comes along with a choice of a lifestyle that is objectively virtuous, that that choice will require a, f a form of exertion that is both external as well as internal, that will be accompanied very often with a semblance of what we would consider to be painful, right? The reason I'm using this word deliberately is because, you know, one of the things that we have been made to believe in the modern world, right? And this is, you know, uh, some of the musings of, of modern philosophers is that pain is bad and that the objective of life is to walk away and to run away from pain. And so, subjective, uh, subconsciously, what may have happened to many of us is that if religious practice is heavy or painful, then we almost by default, right, in the realm of cognitive dissonance, we do away with what is painful, meaning, well, it's more pleasurable, it's more pleasurable for me to have this relationship or to have this financial transaction because it's going to give me this or that or to have this social reality or whatever the case is, whatever we tend to enjoy for ourselves, right? Um, whether those realities are external or, or, or internal. And then Islam comes, right? And the religion comes and says, well, no, you shouldn't do that. Or no, you know, this is what would be preferable. And what, is, what, what Islam is encouraging, it kind of, it rubs up against my sensibilities, you know, in a way that is, that is agitating, that's painful. And because we were so at times conditioned towards pleasure, right, and comfort, and we've been, we've developed almost an aversion to something that's painful. So what do we do? We do away with that was, which is from within the religion. Although what the religion is actually calling me towards is that which is going to bring me life. You know, either da'akum, shouldn't you respond to the call of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, either da'akum lima yuhyikum, that, 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 you know, should you not call, respond to the call of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he's calling you towards that which is going to bring you life? You know, and where else does life exist or happen in the physical realm other than the womb of the mother, right? Is that not where, you know, the quote unquote, the source of life, meaning that Allah uses the mother 
right, which is this, the sacred womb of the mother to be the birthing channel for life, and is not the process of giving life, you know, the process of birth, is it not a painful experience? You know, when a mother, when first, you know, getting pregnant, as the, the, the physiology of the body shifting, and even the emotional state is shifting, and, and you know, the, the, you, you have chemical realities playing out, and you start to develop, you know, uh, whether it's nausea, and then back pains and foot pains and swelling and, and, and sleeplessness and irritation and having to use, you know, the restroom and whatever the case is, it's, it's a, it's a nine month process, you know, that is, that is miraculous. That is profound. That is objectively beautiful, but it's riddled with what it's riddled with painful realities, you know, that kind of undergird it and are prevalent at times. And even, at the moment of birth, you have the the screaming, you know, and the 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 the, the, the agony, and the expressions of of ah, oh, you know that 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 very that release of air that's just saying ah, oh, I'm exhausted, I'm tired, right? And Subhanallah, as a side note here, some of the athar indicate that when the woman who's when the mother is giving birth and she says ah oh, out of agony, then the angels write it down as Allah as if she made a dhikr, she made a remembrance of saying Allah, and all she said was ah, but because Allah rewards, he rewards virtuous pain, you know, he rewards for that, even if it's not even, I'm not even aware of it. And, 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 and that's the spirit here, is that life, life and bringing life to realities in me and around me, and for myself and for my children, it requires hard work. Hard work that's synonymous with being patient with pain. A good, nourishing, objectively virtuous pain. Pain that is synonymous with growth and expansion. You know, and that's you see that in, in the you see that in the created realm. Allah shows us so many signs about how life and growth is synonymous with experiencing some sort of shifting and breaking and altering is not the, the 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 mother's body almost completely physiologically altered to give birth to life and then after the cries and the and the happiness and the elation is overwhelming you know and, 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 you know, sometimes you go through an emotional dip and sometimes you go through an emotional high, but then after a bit, it's like, well, I want another, <laughs> you know, subhanAllah. Why? Because that's the human being. The human being appreciates something that is beautiful, something that is good. And in life, things that are good are usually accompanied with difficulty. And that's something I want us to bring into the space of religious practice. That's a logic and a spirit that I want us to bring into the, the, the space of, 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 of practice and religious practice. Because I don't want us to assume something of our, of our religion that is faulty. And that is faulty in a way that deprives me from gaining access to the bounties that are in store. Right? That, yes... I have to go and I have to walk to Allah for Allah to shower me endlessly. I have to do my part. You know, Allah says in the hadith, if you come to me walking, I'm going to come to you running. And of course, in a manner that is befitting of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But see, the precondition is what? You got to walk. You can't just assume it's going to come. You know, we, we sometimes assume it's like, well, how come Allah hasn't given me? Well, have I positioned myself in a manner and I have I disposed myself in a manner that is befitting, right, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving? That's a, very, that's, a, that's a question that I have to put on myself. I'm not, I, can't, I can't not be going to the gym and working out and walking every day and not eating healthy and then wondering, well, why haven't I lost weight? Well, if I haven't done what I'm supposed to be doing and I haven't put in the requisite efforts and I haven't put in the, the laborious hours 
and experience that pain of good burn, then why, then I shouldn't expect anything in return. You know, so it's a simple logic that I'm, I'm sure all of you are well versed on, but I don't know how often, you know, we really attribute this logic to the, the space of, of spiritual growth and practice. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا Those who struggle in our way, those who struggle in our way, we will guide them on our path. But the, the precondition is what? وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا Those who struggle in our way. And this is the spirit of mujahada. You know, this is the, 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 the spirit of righteous struggle. You know, it's a word that has been used and abused and has maligned, has been maligned and has been played around with by people from within the Muslim space, outside the Muslim space. But regardless, we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about the virtue of what actually mujahada is. The Prophet ﷺ says, Ala ukhbirukum bil mu'min? Should I not tell you about who the mu'min is? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi they say, yes, he says, Man aminahun nas ala amwalihim wa anfusihim. The mu'min, right, the true believer is the one who people feel safe around and that they feel safe when it comes to their, 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 their money and themselves, right? Meaning that I am safe from someone harming me in that particular way. Al Muslim, man salim al Muslimuna min lisanihi wa yadi. That the true Muslim is the one who people are safe from their tongue in their hand. Wal mujahid. And who is the mujahid? Man jahada nafsahu fi ta'atillah. The one who struggles against himself or herself in worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the muhajir. And who is the, the one who migrates? The muhajir man hajar al khataya wa dhunub. The muhajir is the one who leaves mistakes and faultiness and sinfulness. And so here is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu defining and redefining for us what the spirit of a mu'min is and what the spirit of a Muslim is and what the spirit of a mujahid is. And the mujahid is the one who struggles in the worship of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. Struggles against what? Struggles against the self. Because the self, the lower self is amara. The lower self is, is constantly imploring me towards to do the things that are bestial in nature. To enjoy rest, to enjoy food, to covet, you know, uh, is, to have essential relations. It's, it's, it's the lower self doing what the lower self does. But that can be behemi, it can be bestial in nature. Right? And the lower self can be satanic in nature, meaning that it seeks to destroy, it seeks to, uh, to manipulate, right? it seeks to control, it seeks to exaggerate the self and the deluded self. And at times, the, the, lower, the lower self is suburi, it's, a, it's dogged, right? it's harsh and harmful, like, like a hyena is, just rabid in its nature. So you have this lower self that's compelling us towards, you know, being more inclined towards animalistic orientations. And then you have the higher self, which is the self, which is the spirit and the qalb, right? Telling us to know, to be of a greater being and of higher standing. And that, and to, to, to control the lower self and to be more oriented around the higher self requires mujahada. So man jahada nafsahu fi ta'atillah, the one who struggles against him or herself in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّكَ كَادِحٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ كَدْحًا فَمُلَاقِيهِ That our journey towards, of Allah, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a journey of kadh. And this word kadh means struggle, right? It's your, your, your you, know, you, you know, that army crawl on the floor where you're just kind of like crawling in the mud. That's, that, that's a, a good metaphor for how we are going towards Allah. It's, it's a virtuous, righteous struggle. We're, we're pulling ourselves every single day. So every single day to get out of bed and, and to make wudu and to pray fetch. Every single day to open up the mushaf and read a page or two 
and to really benefit and reflect on its verses and to spend like five, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, if not more, reflecting over the verses of the Quran, to, to give charity, to call uh, a loved one, to be patient with a, a difficult family member, to, to, to be patient and, and to be merciful with my mother and my father, to uh, be patient with a child that's becoming increasingly difficult and, and is, is just getting, you know, so incessantly uh, challenging to, to deal with in terms of, you know, their growth and, and their, uh, in their <laughs> evolution as a young man or a young woman. And, 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 you know, it requires so much more patience and so much more, you know, you, Tight, being tight-lipped and being quiet at times and, and picking your battles, it's, it becomes a mind game in and of itself. And that struggle, you know, whether it's with the family or with friends or with community members or with the self, with worship, with prayer, with, with, with how to dress, with how to conduct oneself, all of the challenges, I want us to realize that this is the stuff of life. That is the virtuous, you know, if you will, a good burn that, that we want to we realize to ensure that spiritual growth is happening. And just as anyone who's experienced a good burn, you realize you don't always live in that perpetual state of a burn, you know, meaning that if, 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 you, if you're trying to run 10 miles, right, and if you've never run a mile, running that first mile is going to be a really difficult thing to do and your back is going to ache and everything is going to to you know it's almost as if all the odds are stacked against you but then you get first you get through that first mile and then you continue to burn and you work harder and you push and you push and you allow your mind to almost to will your body right it's mind over matter you will yourself and you say, no, I'm going to finish this mile. And so you walk the mile and then you walk a second mile and then you walk a third mile and then you start to run. And then in, in, in a matter of weeks and if not months, you find yourself running 10 miles and those first, second, third and fourth and fifth miles, they become a figment of your imagination, right? You just, you breeze through them. You, there are those who can run a mile without breaking a sweat but because they've gone through the process. So what I'm encouraging myself and all of my beloved brothers and sisters is to appreciate a good burn and to, and to absorb it while it's happening. You know, so if I feel that my body is really agonizing over having to get up early in the morning or having to spend, you know, an extra 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes praying, and I feel a little bit of, you know, backache or foot ache, that once that burn happens, once that pain happens, I embrace it. I don't run away from it. I don't reject it. I don't allow my lower self to compel me, right, towards relax and relief. No, I say, you know what? I'm going to do this. This is something that I could do. This is something that I should do. It is objectively virtuous. I'm going to work through it. And that, when, when I cultivate that spirit within myself of embracing the virtuous you know, struggle and pain, then what happens is growth happens exponentially, right? Exponential growth happens on all fronts. And I find myself more inclined towards being in loving surrender. So it's like, yeah, Allah, what else do you want me to do? You know, and, and the same thing happens if you're working out. It's like, okay, well, I, 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 I run 10 miles. What else should I be doing? Okay, well, pick up this exercise and then pick up that exercise and pick up this. And then suddenly you have a repertoire of exercises that you're doing. That's building out your entire body. Your, your, each one of your muscle groups, that's, you know, putting yourself into a great cardiovascular shape and, and so on. And you're building out the whole body. And it started with one thing that really developed very well, but then it grew. And then you're fine. Like, wow, in the span of, you know, two months, three months, five months, six months, I have grown so much, right? I could never have imagined that I was doing that, you know, but now look at me today, alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah, because of what? Because I put the hours in. You know, there was a, there was a woman who, um, uh, she was telling her personal story of swimming from Cuba to Florida. Some of you may have, I heard on an NPR once, and they were asking her, you know, 
and she tried to do this, by the way, she started to try to do this, I think when she was like 29 years old, and she finally accomplished it when she was something like 62 or 63. Over 30 plus years of trying to do this one uninterrupted swim from you know, Cuba to Florida. And, and subhanAllah, when they asked her, after all these decades, these three plus decades of trying to accomplish this goal, right? This one singular goal. What is the thing that you're most proud of? And you know what she said? She said, the thing that I really am the most proud of is that every single time I would make an attempt, it would be preceded by anywhere from eight months to, to a year of training, okay? Of intense day-to-day -day being in the gym, being in the swimming pool, whatever the case is, from 8 o'clock to 12. Every morning, that was my routine. From 8 a.m. to 12, meaning four hours, I was in the gym. And she's like, the biggest badge of honor and the biggest sense of accomplishment that I have is that not once did I skip a training. Not once, she said, that I, that I come late meaning that I start my training at 8.01 or 8.05. No, it was 8 o'clock, if not 7.59. And she said, not once did I stop it early, meaning that I stop it at 11.55. I finished it at 12. And she said that, that type of commitment to a regiment and to do it regularly and deliberately with intentionality and to not skip it, that was her biggest sense of accomplishment. And you know, brothers and sisters, when I heard her talking about this, I thought to myself, subhanAllah, that is so insightful for someone who's trying to grow spiritually, is that the real badge of honor and the real sense of accomplishment is that every single day I am with Allah. Every single day that I pray my five prayers, every single day that I pray my nafil prayers, my sunnah prayers before Fajr and, you know, before and after Dhuhr and you know, before and after, and after Maghrib and, and after Isha, and I pray my witr prayer, every time I pick up the Qur'an, every time I make my litanies, my afkar of la ilaha illallah and astaghfirullah, and I send my salawat upon Muhammad, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad, every time I give a charity, every time I call someone, every time I, I, I perfect my outer disposition and my inner disposition for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that is where virtue lies. It is in the regiment. It is in the, 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 the repetition. It is in the, 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 the conditioning of the self to be inclined towards this virtuous act and to not allowing weakness from the self to overtake me. To not allow weakness from my lower self. To not allow... Uh, social pressures or peer pressure from without to compel me to act against my virtues. My virtues being the ones prescribed to me by Allah and his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's the biggest accomplishment that we can make in life. And that's why on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will observe our actions. What did we do? Not what did we accomplish, but what did we do every single day, right? How much did we show Allah that we actually cared every single day? And so what will happen are two things. Number one, we will receive the badge of honor of having been in a state of taqwa. Because this whole fast of Ramadan is what? It's about taqwa. Kutiba alaykum al-siyam kama kutiba ala ladina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. Right? It's about this idea of God consciousness. And as Sayyiduna Umar beautifully illustrates what God consciousness is, he says, imagine yourself wearing a flowy, silky garment, garment, and you're walking through a field of thorny bushes. Taqwa is the way in which you would hold your garment as you're walking through those thorny bushes. You would make sure that, you know, you look to your left and you look to your right and you look in front of you and you look behind you and you kind of gather your garment a little bit closer to yourself so that no thorn, you know, latches onto your silky garment. That's taqwa. And that's a day-to-day -day reality. The way we think of Allah is about thinking about Him all the time. We must 
bring Allah into every factor of our life. And we must bring his opinion of these realities in our, in our lives every single moment. Because when we bring, when we summon the divine opinion and divine guidance, we will see that perhaps there are serious correctives we have to make in our lives. Maybe there's a way in which I have to shift the relationship that I have with my loved ones. Perhaps I am derelicting on my responsibilities. Maybe I have to shift the way in which I make money because perhaps there is a question mark on the way in which I make money. Perhaps I have to shift certain behaviors and practices no matter how socially dominant they are. But the fact of the matter is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has an alternative opinion that is objectively better for me. Regardless of what my nafs wants, my lower self wants, and regardless of what society tells me is, it's always going to be about the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, brothers and sisters. And this, as I've been saying, is the virtuous struggle. This is where when we show Allah that we are sincere and we're honest and we're going to put in the efforts, right? And we're going to struggle in this virtuous struggle against ourselves for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, that he will give us in ways that we don't even ever fathom, you know? that he will allow the skies to open for us and that he will, you know, angels will be summoned to us and that he will gift us from the goodness that he has in store for us. Whether that is, by the way, material or not, that's not what we're talking about. Material, you know, it, it, material, material things are not the only thing that are described as quote unquote good. No, emotional states, psychological states, spiritual states, having good opinions and thoughts, really governing your opinions and your thoughts, having, a, a, having the divine gaze upon you that is with pleasure and joy, that Allah is looking upon you and I in a disposition of pleasure and joy. That's what it's all about. And that happens when we turn to Allah in this way. And so I hope and pray that in this month of Ramadan, we can take this particular spirit into account that we feel the burn you know feel the good burn i know some of you were trying to feel another type of burn the b-e-r-n burn but that that's that's over he uh, <laughs> he put in his uh his, his resignation but i'm talking about feeling the the, the righteous burn, the spiritual burn of 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 prayer a fast of of spending those moments before Maghrib, which are inshallah going to be for many of us just in, in the next hour or two, that I spend them sitting down off my computer, off my TV, off my phone, making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that I, I make my iftar, I spend some quality time with my loved ones, with my family. If I'm by myself and I have no one around me, I'm listening to a good lecture, you know, something meaningful. And then I shut down everything and I get up and I pray Jum'a, I pray Isha. You know, I sit down before Isha, I pray my sunnah on my prayer mat. And then I sit down and I make some dhikr. I ask Allah for forgiveness, for support, for help. I turn to him, right? Then I stand up and I pray my Isha beautifully. And I sit down, I make my dhikr after Isha. Then I pray my two rakahs of sunnah. Then I stand up and then I prepare myself to pray my taraweeh. And I pray as much as I can, you know. Uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, as much, obviously, you know, up until 20 rakaat, I pray with a spirit of commitment, with a spirit of overcoming myself, right? And with a spirit of discipline. And we spoke about this in the khutbah last week, the virtual khutbah, that, that the whole purpose of, Juma, of, of Ramadan is to realize that we can be disciplined and we can sacrifice a lot. And I wanted to accompany that idea with the idea of embracing pain. Don't fear pain. Don't run away from pain. Embrace good pain, right? Embrace it and, and grow through it and, and feel the good burn. And bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, the more we orient ourselves in this disposition and the more we do it repetitively in a disciplined fashion every single day, we are only growing growing, growing beautifully in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you look, and I'll close with this, and inshallah you can put your questions and answers in the chat section. I'll start answering them momentarily. But 
I'll close with this. When you look at the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and you see um, the way his life kind of transpired, you'll see that the Prophet Sallallahu life was full of pain and difficulty, full of it. You know, it was um, those, those first those first, you know, 13 years in Mecca, was it not riddled with, with difficulty after difficulty, after pain, after struggle, him being uh, to have assassination attempts, to be boycotted, his own blessed and beloved wife, Sayyidah Khadija, who, Sayyidah Khadija, who was Lady Khadija, right? She was this magnificent woman, and she was a woman of, 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 of wealth and ability. And, and she was committed to the Prophet Sallallahu in the way of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu She was in the boycott. She was forced into the boycott those years um, in the latter part of the Meccan period. And it is most likely that she died because of that boycott. She died because of, you know, a physical condition that came about of, 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 of that boycott. But you know what Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala uh, did for her? And that's so beautiful. He sent her the angel Jibreel and through the Prophet Muhammad. And he said, Oh Muhammad, give salam to Khadija from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Give salam to Khadija from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and tell her, right, that you have been guaranteed a house in Jannah. And in that house in Jannah, there is no hardship. And there is no difficulty, right? To say what well, that you went through a lot in this dunya and you were patient and you persevered, you know. Fasbir sabran jamila. You know, fasbiru wa sabiru wa rabitu. You know, that's the, that's the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be patient and be perseverant in your patience and tie yourself down, you know, on this virtue. Because Prophet said there's going to come a time where holding on to this religion is like high, holding on to a hot coal. You know, so sometimes you got to like really hold on because many forces at play, internal and without, are saying what? Leave this. Get off of this. Walk away from this. And so Sayyidah Khadija, you know, look at her social status. Look at her economic status. Look at all of it. But she gave it up and she sacrificed. Why? For a virtuous struggle. And she was patiently persevering in that space and the greatest of glad tidings were given to her which was what you are promised a house in jannah that has this it's from pearl and that in it you will find no hardship or difficulty and the most beautiful thing is that allah is sending you his salam and i want us to embrace that for ourselves prophet you know socially <laughs> his circumstances were in decline politically in decline you know this is this is after after prophecy, before prophecy, he was politically great, economically great, socially great. After prophecy, there all these things started to get hit in different ways. But what happened? He was spiritually inclining, spiritually increasing every single day. And the highest point in his life, which was the point of Mi'raj, the highest point, what was it preceded by? The greatest pain. The highest point in his life was preceded by the greatest pain that was, that was predicated upon sacrifice, loss, you know, was, uh, was predicated upon people attacking him and castigating him and assaulting him and throwing them out of, you know, their, their villages. <clears throat> and and on, the, on, the, on, on the tail end and, and on the tail end of that, what happened was what? Was mi'raj, right? Was increase. And so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to embrace a virtuous struggle that, 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 is, that is honorable, that is based in the guidance of the Qur'an and the Sunnah and our inherited sacred tradition so that we live a life that is genuinely pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no matter how much it may at times rub against our senses and sensibilities. But that, that is happening because just as you need to like take sandpaper and, and, and like polish the edges a lot of us, you know, for us, this sacred tradition, it's polishing, polishing the rough edges that need to be polished objectively so that we can be in the most beautiful state of ihsan, you know. And ihsan is that when you're beautiful and excellent, both inwardly as well as outwardly. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all in the sacred month of Ramadan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us all 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to love worship and to love to be with Allah and his messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And may Allah make it that our, our desires and our interests are in accordance with what Allah and his messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, have brought us. Barakallahu feekum. I have a few questions here, so I'll start answering them, inshallah. Um, and if also you can mute your, your phones, and if you want to ask, you can write them in. Barakallahu feekum. Uh, assalamu alaikum, Shaykh, and thank you for that wonderful barakallahu feekum. Please let us know uh, the web address of the Prophetic Living page. Um, so if you go to uh, Prophetic Living, you just type in Prophetic Living. That's the page that I usually teach from different things. So you can go there. Um, what should you recite after hearing the Adhan? Um, that's a very good question. And please continue to ask your questions. Um, um, if you, if you, uh, when they hear the Adhan, you say, Allahumma rabba hadihi da'wa at-tamma wa salatu al-qa'ima ati sayyidina Muhammad al-wasilata wal-fadilata wal-darajata al-rafi'a wa ba'athu Allahu al-maqama al-mahmood al-lazhi wa'attah innaka la tukhlifu al-mi'ad. And so the dua here that is made is Allahumma rabba hadihi da'wa tamma You know, oh Allah, you are the Lord of this perfect call and this complete call, which is the call of the adhan, right? Ad-da'wa tamma That is the greatest of call because it's the call towards what? Towards prayer. Allahumma rabba hadihi da'wa tamma wa salatu al-qa'imah And the established prayer, you are the rabb of, the, you are the rabb of salah. Ya Allah, you are the Lord of prayer. Wa salatu al-qa'imah. Ati. Oh Allah, give Sayyiduna Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Al-Wasila wal-Fadila Al-Wasila wal-Fadila are the stations of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the day of darajat al-Rafi'a and the highest of levels which is Al-Maqam al-Mahmood the station of being the most praised, right? Or the one who is off-praised we ask you, Allah, to grant Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, our master, to grant him those stations. Innaka la tukhlifu al-mi'ad. Ya Allah, you never ever, uh, you know, renege on a promise. Innaka la tukhlifu al-mi'ad. Meaning what Allah has promised Sayyiduna Muhammad, you know, these highest of stations on the day of judgment and in the afterlife. And so a part of our uh, expression of loyalty and commitment is that we are praying and affirming that with this call to prayer, which is our greatest, you know, uh, uh, the greatest thing that we can be called to is salah. You know, hayya ala salah, hayya ala al-falah. You know, come towards success, come towards success. This is because success in all of its meanings is found in prayer. And so we, we supplicate in this, in this disposition of gratitude and this disposition of loyalty, because the Prophet Sallallahu through Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala used him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to bring us this sacred act, and we are uh, forever indebted to Allah and his Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for that. Uh, Assalamu Alaikum, can you please confirm whether it is permissible to pray Taraweeh reading the Qur'an? Barakallahu Feekum. Um, the majority opinion amongst scholars, uh, amongst legal schools is that it is um, it, is, it is permissible to hold the Mus'haf in prayer. Now, um, in the Hanafi school, um, there, there has, there, there, the, the, what seems to be the case is that the dominant opinion is that you cannot hold the Mus'haf. Although I have heard from a number of Hanafi scholars who said that given the circumstances and given the nature of the times that it can be accessed as well. So, um, you know, from, from my opinion, as a, I'm, a, I'm someone who, who adopts the Maliki Madhab, and I know certainly this is the case for the Shafi'i and the Hanbali Madhab that it is allowed to hold the Mus'haf. And, um, you know, and the Mus'haf can be the paper Mus'haf, which is, you know, one of the, these books, or it could be the, the, the Mus'haf that's on your cell phone. Although I would certainly recommend that we don't use our cell phones because it can be a distraction. You know, if you get a text message, you get an update, you get a, um, a notification that can certainly distract you. Um, and uh, and inshallah, you know, try to use the paper, the 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 the, the, the mushaf that's um, that we have in our hands, inshallah. So, hopefully, that answers your question. Any other questions? Um, perhaps, brother, who's moderating, if there's questions, maybe coming through Facebook. I don't know. Um, if there's someone who would, who would like to ask a question, we have a few more minutes together. 
There's one more question that has come in on the chat. Okay. Okay. John. What is your view on giving to charities now versus the last 10 days of Ramadan? Is there a difference in the reward? Um, I, I would say that, you know, um, we should try to give a small amount of charity every single day. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't make it an either or situation because, you know, I don't know if I'm going to make it to the last 10 days. And the Prophet Sallallahu says, خَيْرُ الْبِرِّ عَجِلُهُ The best of good deeds are the ones that are dead, uh, that are the ones that are done immediately, right? The ones that are done immediately. So I would recommend that if there is charity that you can give, uh, give today, right? And you can parse it out. So you can say, Allah, my intention is every single day to give $10, $100, $1,000, whatever, you know, your budget is for charity. And, and try to sparse it out so that every single night of Ramadan, you know, you've, you've hit something, right? Uh, of virtue, inshallah. And, and you've gained access to the possibilities because, you know, um, you know, you don't want to, as they say, put all your eggs in one basket, <laughs> you know, and uh, you, want, you don't want to take a quote unquote gamble by just, you know, hoping that, okay, I'm just going to do it on one day. It's all going to be, you know, it's going to all work out, which is that whole like night of the 27th psychology. Like I'm just going to do all of that night and just kind of cross my fingers. <laughs> you don't want to do that. You want to, you want to spread it out. You want a nice spread. You, know, you want to put it throughout the month, throughout the year. And inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us, um, that moment, you know, the Prophet Sallam, he says that, you know, the, one of the reasons why when, when we eat and we drink, right? And I know that for our modern sensibilities, this is sometimes viewed as one thing, but I'll express to you the way the Prophet Sallam taught us that we, we finish every morsel of food. I remember I was in a particular country and, you know, people would purposefully leave, you know, a, a, a sip or two in the bottom of their cup of tea or coffee. Or, or people would leave some extra food on the plate. And the reason people would leave that food is because they don't want to be considered, um, you know, uncouth, barbaric, right? And that, you know, uh, that I'm somehow like, you know, really, uh, uh, I have this nahm, you know, I have this irascible uh, nature towards food. But the Prophet Sallallahu he would say, no, you finish every last morsel, even the singular grain. And the reason he would say that is because you don't know where the barakah is. You don't know where the blessing, because the food has blessing in it, but you don't know which part of the food has blessing. So you may have eaten 99% of the food, but the blessing may have been in that 1%. So the spirit of Islam is one that is, you always kind of like, you always have a nice spread. Spread in the meaning that you put your eggs in many, many, many baskets, right? As they say in, in the finance world, you got to really diversify your portfolio. So put your, you know, put investments in a lot of good safe stocks, right? So inshallah, in the spiritual space, you know, we take that attitude towards charity. Take to, you know, so for those of you who may have not, who've been leaving a little food behind, you know, number one, it's never good to waste. Obviously, the Prophet Sallallahu has, you know, many prohibitions about wasting or throwing away food. And, um, that type of tabvir is, is categorically accepted. So take less, but finish the whole plate, and, you know, and, and take every last morsel to ensure that the blessing of that food has come into you. So, and what is the blessing of the food, by the way? That the food is actually a source of growth and nourishment, right? And that the, the food does not harm you, but it actually is a source of benefit. So that's what blessing uh, indicates in this particular regard. Okay, we have a few more written questions. Uh, what is your view on giving to charities? Okay, I read that one. Uh, is there a preferred time by which we should start and the Taraweeh prayers? So Taraweeh in particular, we should start them, um, um, you know, shortly after Aisha, right? So, you know, you, you, you take your iftar and then you, uh, you know, you, you have some quiet time, maybe with the family. If you have a family, you maybe chat with a loved one. Perhaps you listen to a lecture, whatever the circumstance you have is. And then Aisha time comes in, you get up, you pray. Pray your Isha, you know, and then, you know, you, you uh, wait for, for a few moments, rest for a little bit, maybe five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever that time is, and then inshallah pray. And try to finish your tarawih um, no later than um, the midpoint of the night. And the midpoint of the night is calculated. So it, the tarawih should always be prayed closer to Isha and should certainly never extend beyond uh, the, 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 the midpoint of the night. And the midpoint of the night is calculated by going from Maghrib, so from sundown to sun up. And those hours 
So let's say those are eight hours. Let's just say for argument's sake, the midpoint would be four hours, right? So from Maghrib, and then you add four, that's, what, that's, that's the midpoint of the night, right? So the midpoint of the night is not from Isha till Fajr. That's more like this. The, the midpoint is from Maghrib to Fajr. And then you calculate the middle point and hope that's clear. So start closer, the most preferred, as close as possible to Isha. And then obviously the most preferred is 20 units. And really I encourage people to do as much as they can and I've said this in, in some of my talks, please do not think for a moment that if you don't pray 20 units, that somehow you haven't prayed Tarawih. No. You know, because some people, what they do is they say, well, if I'm not going to pray 20, I'm not going to do any of it. And that's like an all or nothing mentality. And that's not a mentality that you should bring to the space of worship. The space of worship is do as much as you can and really just push yourself. Some may say like, I, you know, I barely have... 20 minutes of functionality because I'm so beyond exhausted at a certain point. I can barely pray for 20 minutes, pray, pray for 20 minutes, you know, and then if you find that you're able to do more, do more, but don't say, well, I'm not going to pray 20 rakat. I'm not going to read with a juz. I don't have the voice of Sheikh so-and-so or Imam so-and-so. So I'm not going to pray anything. That's, that's a lot. That's what Allah would not want from us. Right? So try your best to pray as much as you can in the pro most proper, you know, appropriate of timings, inshallah. Anything that's done in the latter part of the night or after we sleep is what is called tahajjud, right? That's what's called tahajjud. And that's a prayer that is virtuous in of itself. So tarawih is the earlier part of the night. And then the latter part of the night, which is, you know, the last third or the last two thirds of the night, sorry, the last third of the night, that's, uh, um, that's considered tahajjud. And that's something that, inshallah, as we're trying to like, attain greater and greater spiritual goals, you know, so it's like someone running a half marathon and then someone marrying a full marathon. So maybe, you know, Tarawi uh, um, has a half marathon included with it is, is the Tahajjud that's like a full marathon, inshallah. Um, on Juma, if the family does Jamaat at home, can the prayer be two rakat? No. Um, uh, the, well, the, the, the prayer at home should be dhuhr, so it should be four rakat, right? Four rakat, inshallah. And that is what's best for everyone who's praying at home, to pray dhuhr. And inshallah, you pray your dhuhr with the intention that you would have prayed in jama'ah in the masjid. And so, you know, don't think that it's any less virtuous. No, we're praying dhuhr at home because we have no other choice. Otherwise, we would have been in the masjid. So alhamdulillah, pray for, um, and, and, and the intention is a dhuhr prayer. Um, question from Facebook. If both spouses work and gives a cat jointly, does it count for both? Um, so if, if money's being pulled into one space, right? And that is both people's money and whatever that money is. So let's say it's a hundred thousand dollars. So yes, on that a hundred thousand dollars, there would need to be zakat paid on that hundred thousand dollars. And inshallah that applies to both. Right? So if each of you brought in, you know, 50,000 or one brought 16, the other one 40, regardless that hundred, we have to pay zakat on it. Right. And, and this is all just, you know, in theoretically speaking, then you would pay the two and a half percent on that hundred and that inshallah would apply to both uh, spouses. Khair, inshallah, brother, uh, are we, uh, how we, I, I, it's five thirty, or do we have any, Oh, mashallah, you're with us. You have to unmute yourself. You got, <laughs> we have to hear you. You're muted. I, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Uh, there you go. <laughs> so we have, we have spent the hour with, uh, with, with you. It's been a wonderful lecture. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, we'll bring the session to an end. Thanks Inshallah. very much, everyone. And we'll, we'll see everyone um, either on the Prophetic Living page throughout the week. I'm doing dua every night. Or you can join us, inshallah, next Sunday for our next session with the ICB. Well in community. Barakallahu feekum. Wajazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.